tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, friends. Hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. But there are no four-day weekends at Casa de Blood. I don't care how much tryptophan you got running through your veins. Oh, that reminds me. Public service announcement here. If you like having leftovers in the house, I highly advise against having a pet alligator. The scaly pricks won't even leave you a turkey neck. That is all. Eh, at least they don't talk politics at the dinner table. Come on in, friend. I'm going healthy tonight, y'all. No cigarette. Uh, oh. Okay, that's better. So tonight we welcome back our pal, Alfred Alley, author of several great novels and four collections of excellent short stories published by our good friends at Velox Books. So smoke them if you got them, and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigmarole, yo. Oh, hey. I didn't see you there. You know, Drew Blood's Dark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog ad-free and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. Our first tale tonight comes from the collection We Will Find a Place for You, published by Velox Books. So, without further delay... From author Alfred Alley, I give you The Blue House. The Blue House wasn't blue. Instead, the wooden exterior was white, with red adorning the gables and dormers. But the door, the one shielded from the elements by the columned L shaped porch, was indeed painted a deep blue. The three-story Texas Victorian stood at 410 Walnut Street since 1900, and since then every owner kept the paint fresh, even on the black metal fencing surrounding the lot. The grass remained low, but always a vibrant green, even under the sweltering Texas heat, with two pecan trees on each side of the front lawn protecting much of the lot from the punishing heat. Damon Estrada never knew anyone who lived there. The property and its meticulously maintained perfection essentially hid in the background. But today, he would work in the Blue House as the only employee of his struggling company, Main Street Contractors. His father always told him hard work wins out. Damon often looked back and wondered if his father had a little more time, just a little, to finish the last job at the Blue House, if his hard work would have actually won out. Damon would make sure his own would. He converted an old Ford Transit Connect van, a staple of any repair business, and slapped his name in the Main Street Contractor's logo on the side in a bright blue. Damon had his business name printed on shirts that hugged him a little too tight in the midsection. He wasn't 20 anymore, and 40 drew closer with every lower back ache and grinding knee. When Damon stopped the van in front of the blue house, a man stood outside the gate. The old man was bald, chinless, and in a brown suit with a red tie that was far too wide and too long. He strode to Damon and held out a hand. Elkin Watts, City Council, he said. Damon shook his hand and tried to wipe away Elkin's sweat from his palms without being too obvious. Elkins went over the job. He explained that no one had been inside in over a year. 
He wanted Damon to make any necessary repairs, touch up anything that needs touching up. You know, my pop started the job here, but he only got a few days in, Damon said. Mr. Estrada was your father? Yes. Well, I'm sorry to hear about him. We brought a contractor in since then, but he didn't get very far before he skipped town. Tore Pop up not to finish the job. I know it's been two years, but it feels good to finally finish this for him, Damon said. Elkins nodded. He gave Damon a business card with his cell on the back. Look, if you need anything at all, call me, but be quick. No more than two weeks. That's a hard deadline. Should be plenty of time, Damon said. Elkins grimaced and tilted his head. Well, yeah, the house has a way of getting away from you. Three days in, and Elkins' words proved prophetic. Damon set down a tool, then found it on another floor. Freshly charged batteries became exhausted in a matter of minutes. He painted trim that pulled away from the wall, tightened plumbing that then started leaking, and replaced a handful of warped floorboards that seemed to curl behind him. Each day, he assumed his task was done, but the next morning, of course, another item in the house would be amiss. A vanished light switch cover, or maybe a broken bulb in the kitchen. Damon's father only did two days on the job before he was too sick to continue. He never mentioned anything to Damon about unexplained noises, only his regret at leaving the job unfinished a potential major payday for his family unclaimed. Outside, the stone walkway curving to the front of the house was immaculate. Not even a single weed grew between stones. The grass was short and the trees trimmed, but inside, the house crumbled behind each completed task. The silent building drew breath and exhaled in moans and creaks. The sound of vermin scratching and running around in the attic spaces echoed. He heard creaks downstairs, stone and ash trickling into the fireplace, shuffling in the basement. Sounds of ever-present but never visible life just behind him, just underneath him, just feet above him. He put off the basement, the events of the previous days weighing on him and becoming forefront in his thoughts no matter how hard he tried to ignore them with music. Damon pushed the volume on his portable radio as high as possible. He even tried talking through his tasks, creating a rapport with his invisible partner to distract from the increasingly intensive thought that no matter where he moved in the blue house, unseen eyes followed. The scratches and animal sounds ceased, but the sound of breaking plates, crashing boxes, all issuing from empty rooms grew in frequency. On the fifth day, Damon walked through the living room. In a jovial mood, he called out and asked the spirits to let him get his work done in peace. The floor beneath him shook as something slammed against it from below, from the basement. Damon finally had enough and ran outside. He pulled the business card from his truck and called Elkins. The man answered on the third ring and cleared his throat. <coughs> yes? This is Damon. At the Blue House? Yes, of course. How goes the repairs? Two weeks, right? If that's okay, we can pay for the work done so far if you need to move on. Damon thought. He licked his lips and looked at his logo on the van. Main Street contractors parked out front for all to see. Hello, Mr. Estrada? What happens if I take longer? You won't. Two weeks. That's all we're paying for. But if you need anything, if something has happened... I'm good. Damon said his goodbye and hung up the phone. He looked up at the house. It's just a house. Entering the front door, he gently closed it behind him. A loud slam echoed from the basement, like something large thrown against the wall. Just a damn house. He went down the steps into the basement, each step cracking under his weight. He worried they would splinter under him, almost as much as he worried the door above him would slam shut of its own accord. Damon found the basement bare, not just free of debris or furniture, but surprisingly well lit, 
considering only two small rectangular windows allowed sunlight in. No dust coated the floors. No cobwebs clung on the wall. No light switches. No electrical outlets. There were only bare walls and a ceiling, which made the tool belt and glove all the more glaring. The belt, resting on the floor by the wall across from the stairs, and the fingers of the glove jutting from the wall itself, about five feet from the floor. To Damon, it was like someone standing just behind the wall, reaching out with hands now trapped in it. No, Damon thought to himself. No way. He picked up the belt, a name written on the outside in marker, along with a length of masking tape that had the company's name scrawled on it as well. Damon dropped the belt and examined the gloves. He could see a good inch of each finger sticking out, and just the tip of the thumb. He recognized the black and orange pattern on them. He owned a pair himself. Damon batted at the fingers, then felt relief when he found them empty. No fingers encased meant no bizarre murder scene. Damon wasn't trapped in a horror movie, just dealing with a few unnerving but unexplainable circumstances. Just a weird drywall mishap and a lost belt. On his lunch break, Damon left the house and sat on the curb outside. He felt the breeze and the sun bore down on him, but despite the rising heat, he preferred to be outdoors. The house weighed on him, just a house. He had been in houses like it, not necessarily haunted, but something about the way the sunlight filtered in, the way the rooms were arranged, and the furniture spaced. The entire atmosphere felt oppressive. In a weird way, Damon didn't feel unwelcome in the blue house, though. He felt quite welcome. The thought made him sick. He took his brakes on the curb, under the burning sun, mopping sweat from his forehead in between bites of his turkey sandwich. Inside, he never felt hot, the air never stuffy, which was just as well. The barred windows were sealed shut. He put the empty water bottle and sandwich bag into his lunchbox and took out his phone. He googled the company on the tool belt and gave them a call. A gruff voice answered with the company's name and asked if Damon needed anything. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing some work at the Blue House, Damon said. He coughed into his other hand. I see. Help you with anything, the voice answered. Well, I found a tool belt. Has the name of your company and the name Wells on it. Wells? You sure about that? I am. Found it in the basement on the floor. We had a Wells here for a time. Great. Want me to bring this by after work? Eh, yeah, keep it. No one's seen or heard from Wells in over a year. Damon thanked the man and hung up. Damon told himself he was just a contractor finishing a job, not the next victim in a horror movie. He dialed the police next and introduced himself. Before he could explain the nature of his call, the officer asked if he was the one fixing up the blue house. Yes, I am, Damon said. Well, you don't have time for chit-chat then. You only got two weeks. No, you see, I found a belt, a tool belt, in the basement. I called the company and they said the guy who owned it is missing. Griffin? The officer asked. No. Frank? Frank's maybe. No, Wells, Damon said. Wells? Well, I'll be. He laughed. We haven't seen him in a year. Well, do you need this? Might be of some value. And there's a glove in the basement. Just one glove? The officer asked. Yes. Stuck in the wall. Fingers sticking out. I see. The officer yawned. <sighs> Sorry. Late night. Well, just leave it outside. I'll pick it up shortly. And what about the glove? Might as well leave it. Probably plaster over it, right? In movies, characters head to the library for exposition, find out the history of the house, find the right newspaper articles after five minutes of looking. Damon didn't know where to start, so he decided to skip that stretch of the horror film and just call the man who hired him. Elkins arrived as Damon finished day seven, soon to start his second and final week in the blue house. In that time, a pipe burst in the guest bathroom. 
A large crack spread across the master bedroom wall like a dark bolt of lightning. Each day, new damages, new repairs. Damon explained as much. Elkins nodded. Yes, the house has a way of getting to you. That's why we limit it. Two weeks, no more. When was the last time anyone lived in the house? Damon asked. Twenty. Twenty-five years? Elkins answered. He loosened his tie, then stopped and pulled the tie off completely. He exhaled heavily and threw up his arms. Everyone who has stayed in that house for more than two weeks has vanished without a trace. I don't know why. No one does. Full disclosure, I think it eats people. Damon laughed. Elkin shrugged. I'm just being honest with you. You notice stuff breaking you already fixed? Or stuff you didn't notice before? Elkins asked. Yeah, I just said that. You feel watched? You feel drawn to the basement, but something stops you most times you try to go down there? Damon said nothing. It's cold in there. Pretty cold, right? It's 98 degrees right now, and the sun has been down for an hour. Damon cleared his throat. Why didn't you tell me any of this? We need the place fixed. We have been honest in the past, but it didn't help. We thought we'd try giving you a hard deadline and no hard and fast reason why. We're losing too many fucking contractors. What's happening to them? Damon asked. Don't know, Elkins said. He shrugged. I got nothing. Hey, you want a story? Talk to the coroner. I'm not telling it because just remembering it is more than enough to keep me up at night. And tomorrow night. Good night, Mr. Estrada. And good luck. For a moment, Damon considered running. At best, he's working for a madman. At worst, the house eats people. But he poured everything into Main Street contractors. As his father said, hard work wins out. You don't back down. Damon watched Elkins leave and decided to call it a day himself. He went inside to grab his phone and some tools. He stopped in the living room, just as he reached for his phone. He felt it, an ache, a pain with a weight that seemed to pull his heart into his stomach. He turned around, scanning the dark room. He saw nothing to his relief, but his phone was gone. He knew. Damon turned on the flashlight and went straight for the basement door, which was open. He swallowed and repeated his mantra about the building just being a house and stepped into the doorway. He shone the light and found the phone sitting at the bottom of the steps. He shone the light through the steps to see if anyone was crouching beneath him. Nothing. No one. He took each step slowly and advanced down the stairs. He reached down and picked up his phone. He scanned the room again with the light and stopped at the glove. He could see the fingers extended further this time. He could see the entire thumb. The smooth drywall was now dotted with bumps and bulges across the surface. If he didn't know better, he would swear something was coming through. Damon knew better, of course, but still thought a visit with the coroner might be in order. Elkins provided the number of Hayes, the county coroner. He arranged to meet at the local barbecue joint, a food truck parked under an awning. The place had a reputation as the best in the Tri-County area. Damon took a seat at a giant wooden cable spool that acted as a table. A plump man in his fifties, hair a shining white, slapped him on the back. You, Mr. Estrada? That's me, Damon grumbled. He inched away. Well, the name is Hayes. You caught me on a day off. Just got back from the lake. I got four more PTO days left, and I'll use them on Lake Steinbring. You fish, Mr. Estrada? Not really. Fishing is a loose term. I mainly drink cheap beer in an old boat, like my father before me. I'll die out there, God willing. Anyway, you on week two at the Blue House, right? Everyone seemed to know. Damon chuckled and said Elkins told him the coroner could clear up some things. Certainly, certainly. 
The owner of the food truck dropped a box of light beer at the nearby table and invited the men to help themselves. Don't have a liquor license, but he can still share with his friends. <laughs> Good kid, Hayes laughed. He stopped laughing. He looked down at his folded hands and exhaled. Look, what I do is worthwhile. It's important. I help families. I give them a why and a how, and bring a little closure. I want to do good in this world. I like to say I never hate anyone I see on or off the table. But that house? I hate that mean old bitch. You talk like it's alive, Damon said, popping the cap off one of the beers. It is alive. Or more accurately, to me at least, it's a doorway to something else that is very alive. Very mean. It's not going anywhere. It seemed to that. We're just doing what we can. Why not burn it down? Hell, why not lob a damn grenade at it? Damon asked. Hayes chuckled. He grabbed a beer, downed a third of it in one gulp, belched and continued. He explained that for years people bought the house. They moved in. They disappeared or left town or something. No one knew and no one could find a trace of them. Finally, about 30 years ago, a volunteer fireman named Elkins, maybe you've met him, decided to burn it down. Old Elkins gets out there. Then he gets a call on his radio. A friend of his is dead, a councilman. Dropped dead in his home, just like that. Said the councilman looked at his wife in this very confused way, and that was that. I hadn't been at the county long, but I did the autopsy. I found a piece of wood in his stomach. Big, sharp, very distinct shape, like something cut it out with a jigsaw or something. Couldn't have been chewed or swallowed, just impossible. Elkins talked to a friend, a guy who just joined the police force. He investigated the last disappearance, and he recognized the pattern on the wood, from the trim in the living room. We took it there. Fit like a damn glove. Did you tell anyone? Damon asked. Tell them what? Heh. <laughs> After that, we knew the house wouldn't die. It refuses to. You know that what if, where you can shoot one person to save a bunch more? Well, it's obvious you shoot that person. But when the gun is in your hand, it's different. If we try to destroy it, someone dies. So we make it innocuous. We paint it and mow the lawn. It looks lived in and everyone ignores it. Kids stay away. But we have to keep it that way. Limit how long someone is there. Damon started his second beer. Hayes finished his third. Just walk away. You've done enough. Elkins will pay you the full two weeks if you ask. No, I... You don't walk away from a job. Hard work wins out. Heh. <laughs> Kid, I work 40 hours a week. And if they want a second more of my time, there better be a damn good reason. A reputation ain't worth it. A payday ain't worth it. Hard work wins out is what keeps losers from kicking themselves for bending over for some rich dickhead their whole lives. Damon took another drink and remembered his father, wasted away in a hospital bed. He was so close, he would tell Damon. Another job, another chance, and things could have been different. If he could have just finished the blue house. Damon slammed down his drink. He took a breath and thanked Hayes for his time. God don't love a working man, kid, Hayes called. Hell, he don't hate him either. Just doesn't give a fuck. Damon flipped him off. He turned out the rest of Hayes' rent and jumped into his van. It was late. He needed sleep. He had work to do. The sun barely rose when Damon parked in front of the house and started unloading his tools. He carried them up the steps and deposited them into the front entryway. He dropped a full plastic gas can with a thud when Elkins arrived. Hayes told me about your talk. I'll do it. Pay you the full two weeks for a week and a half. Sound fair? No, sir, Damon said. Fact is, I have a job and a reputation. I do it right. Hard work wins out. This is different, Mr. Estrada. This place, it leads somewhere else. 
and it takes people. They don't come back. We don't know what we're doing, but we don't want anyone else hurt. I'm not done, Damon said. But no more than two weeks, understood? You got it, boss. Elkins left. Damon turned around and faced the house, hands on his hips. Out loud, he told the house his intention. Finish everything today. His insurance would be the five-gallon can of gasoline. He stepped inside the house and removed the cap from the gasoline container in his hand. He set it on the ground, and then he held up a lighter. I know you want this stuff fixed. I know you're quick. But are you quicker than a lighter? He felt the vibrations at his feet. Then the house seemed to careen. Damon dropped to the ground. The gas can threatened to topple. Damon cursed and righted the can before it could spill. The house shook again. Minuscule aftershocks. He heard the sound of tumbling stone and debris beneath him and the creak of the basement door opening. Don't break any more than I can fix in a day, you hear? Damon shouted. He stood up and stepped toward the basement door. Inside, he could see a light. A massive glow erupted from the basement. Damon should have run, but again he felt welcomed. He descended the steps and the entire wall where the gloved fingers jutted out was a solid block of light. The doorway, he thought. Damon felt fear melt away, like leaving a theater after a scary movie. He was stepping into the sunlit parking lot where no ghosts could dwell. He approached the light, left hand out. He felt comfort, welcomed. The glow hummed like a chorus of small birds. Damon felt childhood peace. He felt cradled in his mother's arms. Stop, he told himself again and again. A little voice inside, the master of fight or flight, told him to run. Damon stopped. He glanced behind at the stairs and then he turned to the wall again. The light was gone. The wall returned, but now shredded and torn. Pieces burst open like a bomb exploded behind it. The bits of drywall and wood floated suspended in the air, frozen. Damon could see other objects. Bone, hands, arms, skulls and spines, all either frozen in a state of coming together or bursting apart, flying forth from the wall. Not a single bone moved. Not a tiny piece of drywall dust rattled or dropped. Damon backed away. As he came closer to the stairs, he glanced back to make sure he didn't trip. Turning back toward the wall again, he found the dark sockets of a skull, splotched in a green mold staring at him. Above him, a suspended wave of bone threatened to collapse onto him. Again, nothing moved. Except now, he could see the mold moving like millions of tiny insects, crisscrossing and swarming the skeletal matter. Damon moved up the stairs quickly and tripped for a split second, but turned back to the skeletal wave as fast as possible. The wave now collapsed, like all of the Sedlik ossuary burying him in an avalanche, a disorganized wall of bone frozen inches above his prone form. He crawled on his back, moving up the steps and through the doorway. He kicked the door shut with his foot and scrambled to his feet, bolting to the front door. Behind him, the door shattered and there was a sound like a rock slide rumbling into the space. He kicked the can over as he gripped the door, which would not budge. <laughs> Trapped, Damon hissed. Would his father have been too? Would it take him to the doorway? Just a house. Would he be trapped behind the drywall, trying to escape? No. No, he wouldn't. Damon fumbled for the lighter. Hard work wins out, Pop. He grabbed the lighter. No way out now, but no reason to leave another job unfinished. Damon lit it, the fumes instantly catching flame. Damon burned, but the walls screamed.
And that was The Blue House by Alfred Alley. A good reminder that hard work does win out sometimes, but other times it's best to knock off early. Our next one is a tale of cosmic horror from the same collection. So without further delay, I give you The Stone Tree. Silas slept, so his father Vaughn told him a story in low whispers. Vaughn's grandfather watched a fallen star. Not a faraway streak of light in the heavens, but a burning mass that tore across the sky, singeing the treetops. He and he alone witnessed the burst of green light, a fraction of a second, before the forest darkened at once, enveloped in night. Vaughn's father told him the story as his grandfather died when he was young. To Vaughn, his grandfather was the man never far from a recliner, one made of black cracked leather and exposing small tufts of white. He wore jeans, a flannel shirt even in summer, and parked himself near a window air conditioning unit or a space heater depending on the weather. But at one time he witnessed a star fall from the heavens. It would be years later while deer hunting when Vaughn's then 12-year-old grandfather would discover the stone tree. He shot the animal, but it fled on adrenaline and left a weak crumb trail of blood and trampled brush. By the time he found the animal, it was crying out in pain. He watched the animal struggle against the lone tree in a small clearing, one with a massive trunk with small withered limbs jutting out from the top like a giant tree stump that decided to live again. The bark gleamed green. Pawing at the ground, the deer's body remained leaning against the tree. As Vaughn's grandfather approached, he realized the animal was stuck to the tree, shaking and swaying to free itself. He watched blood spread over the animal's back but the liquid continued to spread, never dripping or running in defiance of gravity. The blood took on a dark hue, and the animal stopped struggling. The deer, gasping and grunting, leaned its head against the tree, where it became frozen in place. He watched for hours as the bark slowly coated the deer, until it became one with the tree, dark glass frozen in place until Vaughn's grandfather drew close. Then he could hear the creature grunt, glowing for a moment. Vaughn's grandfather told his son Ephraim, who would eventually tell his own son about the stone tree. The tree never bloomed. It never changed color. Birds would occasionally rest on its branches and then fly away again, but some bonded with the tree like small glass ornaments. As far as they could tell, the tree only took in the wounded, the sick. As far as they could tell, nothing in the tree ever died. The warning was passed on, as Vaughn's grandfather understood that no matter where in the forest he went to hunt or to walk or fish, he would be drawn there. He could move in the opposite direction and soon find himself before the stone tree he should have left behind miles before. The tree never moved, but it drew in life like a magnet. Ephraim noticed this, that on a visit to the tree, one could see coyotes, bobcats, even mountain lions, all circling the tree. They would flee when people arrived, the spell broken. But something drew them, even if only a moment. When his father showed the tree to him the first time, Ephraim watched the birds circling above round and round the stone tree. Ephraim often ranted about fallen stars. With every space probe or Mars rover he saw launched on the news, Ephraim would remind his son they needed to stay away. Nothing kind waited for them up there. Vaughn became obsessed for a time, devoured everything he could find on UFOs, usually at the library, as his father never wanted a computer in the house. He asked for a telescope for several years in a row, but Ephraim would tell him if he wanted to see what was in the stars, then go into the woods. 
Go and watch the animals glow and cry out in the dark, his father would say. Go see the stone tree. But keep a distance, of course. Like his father and grandfather before him, Vaughn lived on the land. He built a house, married a woman he loved, a woman who loved him too. He had a son and for a moment could stand on his back porch and eye his domain. A house filled with love, a forest of life. He even bought a telescope and would himself stare into the night sky, looking for distant planets. But Vaughn never witnessed anything fall to the earth. He could never understand how a sky so filled with stars, so many minuscule balls of light, could at once be so empty. He never felt alone in the woods until he looked into the sky. Then he felt the loneliness could crush him. Vaughn paused his story. His son stirred, sleep always fitful these days. Vaughn sighed and continued. But such moments of peace and grace cannot survive. There are predators, there are prey. There is illness, there is disease. Peace is really just a moment for the enemy to regroup. Cells in his son's body replicated without regard, spreading cancer through his body until, by his fifth birthday, Silas was sent home and assigned a hospice nurse. Vaughn was struck at how thin his boy became, but still he breathed strong breaths, even with the end so near. Look at my son, Vaughn thought to himself. Look at him fight. Look at him breathe. Vaughn stopped his story then. He watched his son sleep and stood up. He walked away from the hospital bed in the living room. Vaughn stood on the back porch because he needed a moment. Caring for someone he loved as their own broken cells drained them away broke him. He didn't want to lose his son. He wanted his son to die. He wanted his wife back, but he understood. He hated her for leaving. He wanted life back. He wanted to die. Vaughn walked and soon found himself before the tree, ornate in sculptures of life, big and small, a magnet for life. He stood before the stone tree and approached. He could hear gentle songs from birds on branches. The deer exhaled. No illness could take the creatures bound to the tree. Nothing could deny them of life, even decades later. He returned home. He had been gone far too long, but at least the nurse had been there. She tried to prepare him, tried to speak with him about the inevitable and find an eventual peace. A good woman, but something twisted so tight in Vaughn the pressures became too much. His thoughts coalesced behind an idea that seemed so obvious, so perfect, a solution. He told the nurse goodbye. She introduced herself many times, but he still referred to her as ma'am. He didn't want a connection. She understood. She left him for the evening and would return early the next morning. He watched the twin red glow of her taillights leave the driveway, round the bend and gently blink out as she drove away. Vaughn worked quickly, disconnecting the IV and bundling his son up in his arms wrapping the blankets tightly around him. He woke just enough to ask where they were going. Vaughn told Silas he needed to see something. He needed to see a special something in the woods. He repeated his tale about the fallen star, but now in his story the tree was a glowing obelisk of beauty, with the ability to help those in need. In his mind he remembered his father talking about the tree that it drew life but wanted death. It wanted the sick with little interest in the ones who thrived. He always assumed the tree was dead when the fallen star made contact. Aches gripped his legs as he navigated the brush and held his son so light now in his arms. He slid down embankments and held his son high to keep him away from the rushing creek water. He struggled through paths as free of brambles and thorns as possible. 
Sweat poured and chilled his face. He wheezed but walked on. His son never spoke and barely moved in his father's arms. He didn't know which direction to go, but knew such a detail didn't matter. They would find the tree, and soon he felt a heaviness in his chest and stepped into a clearing before the stone tree. Silas had fallen asleep. Just as well, Vaughn thought. He approached the tree and stared into the bark. In the dead of night, a slight phosphorus glow of green peeked through. He held Silas against himself with his left arm, and with his right struggled to remove the blankets. Silas said he was cold, and Vaughn halted. He looked down at his son, brown hair like his own, but now gone. Cheeks sunken, frame gaunt. The life the boy exuded every day barely ebbing through him now. My son, Vaughn thought. He watched him breathe mighty breaths, he told himself. No, he is not ready to go. He shouldn't. He took a step forward, leaning against a tree, and gently placed his son against it. Silas screamed. He screamed and he cried. His frail limbs struggled as the bark pulled his son from Vaughn's grip. He panicked. Vaughn cried out apologies and tried to free his son, but he could not wrestle him away from the stone tree. Curled now in almost a fetal position, his knees nearly to his chest and his arms crisscrossed across his chest, Silas stopped moving. Pale skin turned to stone, streaked in a green glow. He looked straight ahead, away from his father's gaze. He didn't make a sound. Vaughn dropped to his knees and called out to his son. He put his face against his son's and felt only cold stone. But his son spoke. Daddy? Vaughn spoke to him until the sun rose. What do you see? What do you hear? Do you feel? Months passed, and still Vaughn would ask these questions, but he never understood the answers. What did Silas mean by the strange stars he could see? What did he mean by the glowing forest he could wander when his father woke him? In between their visits, what was the blue sleep? Vaughn took what supplies he needed before the nurse arrived. Then he set his house on fire and watched it burn from his new home in the forest with his son. He expected people to search the woods for him, but no one ever arrived. He held out for weeks before his first supply run found him walking into a neighboring town. No one so much as looked at him. Glimpsing himself in the glass of a storefront window, he could see why. He looked thin, his face coated in gray stubble, the hair on his head greased strands. His clothes seemed loose, wrinkled, and dirty. Who would approach him? Who would bother? but the world around them mattered as little to Vaughn as it did to Silas. Vaughn grew old in a tent next to the tree. He tried a camper but found walls between him and his son to be nerve-wracking. He found the comfort on cold nights and oppressively hot days overwhelmed him with guilt. Silas claimed he felt no cold or heat, but Vaughn insisted on suffering it for them both. So the years passed. His son, there each day to curl into the strange dark bark of the stone tree, his father always nearby. Changes in technology meant he could eventually show his son what was happening in the world, show him children's shows and new music, try to keep him updated on the world he should have been experiencing. Silas cared little. His voice took on an echo and at times almost a metallic ding like speaking through a strange filter. He talked more about the stars and little else. One night, as Vaughn hummed to himself and ate dinner from an open can of beans, his son spoke. Do you hear it? You hear what, buddy? Vaughn asked, setting the can onto the ground and scooting closer to the tree. The fallen lights, like Granddaddy saw. 
They're getting closer now. After that, Vaughn could never distract his son from talk of the new fallen stars. The great green lights burning through space, hurtling to Earth. You remember the beach, buddy? That big trip? We spent a whole week on that Alabama beach. Six nights cost as much as four house payments. But we had fun, right, buddy? Stars. Daddy. Lots and lots. Ready to meet us. Vaughn's voice changed as well, growing rough and low. He said little. He slept more. When his joints burned, he finally relented and visited an emergency room. Tests showed the old man had a spreading cancer and little hope of recovery. The disease got them both, only out of order, Vaughn thought. Vaughn thought of his son. He asked more about the forest, the blue sleep, those strange stars. Vaughn wanted to know what was there when he was gone, what would be there if he went away. At times he thought of the boy as little more than a statue, but others he felt he could pull him from the tree if only he could touch him, if only he could grab that part of his son and take it away from the darkened stone that glowed green on moonless nights. My boy, does he breathe? He would watch the night sky. He wondered if what was coming would be here soon or years from now. Would they still be here to greet them? Would anybody? October, an early frost. Vaughn could barely move, his muscles burning, the pain in his joints spreading throughout his body, radiating and pulsating. He mustered his strength to draw in breath, and dark seeped into his peripheral vision. Silas. Not long now, he had to move. Silas. He had to reach his son. He had to reach the tree. He dragged himself from the tent. Vaughn crawled on hands and knees to the stone tree and managed to bring himself standing to his feet, staring at his son curled into the tree. Wise beyond his years, but always five. Always that frail frame on the verge of death, not encased in stone. Silas seemed so small. Vaughn wanted to hold him again, to feel skin against skin, to feel warmth and the twist and turns as his son cuddled against him. The tree attracts life, but the tree only takes death. Now Vaughn is close. He thinks he will feel his son's hand in his, and they together will enjoy the blue sleep, and when something wakes them, walk the glowing forest and stare at those strange stars. They would watch what was coming, watch it rain down and encase the dying in stone, an earth of great monuments and frozen moments. He placed a hand against a tree and felt the bark stir. Daddy? Vaughn fell forward against the tree, against his son. The pain tore through him, but he didn't have the strength to cry out. Before the oozing dark liquid coated him, Vaughn took one look above, one glimpse at the vastness of a midnight sky, and marveled at the fallen stars, the bursting green lights now raining down on them. Then he turned away, looking at his son, the liquid cold beyond anything, covering his eyes and Vaughn could finally see Silas. He could see him there, in front of Vaughn, and bathed in an array of lights unfamiliar. And that was The Stone Tree by Alfred Alley. 
a good reminder that you need more Alfred Alley in your life. Luckily, he's got four short story collections and a novel for you on audible.com. Uh, Y'all know that Jeff guy who hangs around here and drinks all my damn beer? He narrated them and hopes you'll pick them up. And so do I, because it'd be real nice if old Jeff could buy his own damn beer. Plus, he did a fantastic job on them, y'all. A little about the author. Alfred Alley is a horror author from Texas, giggity. His novels Apartment 239 and the sequel High Strangeness are available now on Amazon.com. Grab Apartment 239 on Audible, friends. You won't regret it. The stories you just heard are from his horror collection, We Will Find a Place for You, available in Kindle, paperback, hardcover, and audiobook. Hey, thanks, Alfred, and thanks to Velox Books, publisher of High Octane Nightmare Fuel. Check out their site, veloxbooks.com, for your next great read. And do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. I need soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and I appreciate it. To hear a premium mad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillintellsdarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook. And we're accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Ten Bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. And if there's none left in the cooler, you can blame Jeff for that. A big shout out and thank you to all my patrons. I love you guys. I really appreciate the help. And so does Chester. He's getting fat, actually. If you want to become a patron and support old Drew Blood and what I do, go to patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood. Thanks, y'all. And to all the listeners out there, may the wind be at your back and may the road rise up to meet you. Happy Native American Heritage Day, y'all. And go fuck yourselves. (laughs) See y'all next time. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.